This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's a place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here. As we always say one more time, we're really pleased today to have a guest with us, Shirley Davis, and she's going to talk about something that will roll your socks up and down, DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. It sounds like a mouthful, but I know some people out there have tuned in just to hear this story because it's frequently overlooked. It's a serious problem if it's overlooked. Thanks for joining us, Shirley. We really appreciate you coming on board. I'm glad to be here. So what we're going to do, first of all, is just do a little bit of an announcement from our sponsors, and then we'll learn more about Shirley in just a moment. Uh, you listeners already know how much we love the reality of data here at CBJ. And today we welcome our clinical friend and our new sponsor partner, Direct Health Access Laboratory. With over 3 million studies, they are deep leaders of experience with the big picture of really measuring, for example, methylation, cryptopyrrole, and copper challenges. They provide a global service with a molecular focus. Please stay tuned more in the middle. And then, in addition, you also know how much we love the reality of data in the sense that we see the progress happen with individuals who really get down and get into the details in their recovery process in a residential treatment center. So the data comes up when you get to know somebody better and you see them longer over a more complete uh, treatment course. And we're also pleased to welcome a new sponsor and partner with a deep interest in those fresh options to address the complexity of adolescent treatment failure nationally and internationally. For 80 years, the nonprofit Barry Robinson Center teams in Norfolk, Virginia, provide adolescent and child residential care on an evolved family, interpersonal level with a global uh, overview. They are, in fact, TRICARE friendly. So more later, we'll talk about them in just a moment. Now, let me introduce you to Shirley. Shirley's an interesting person. She lives out in Mattoon, Illinois, and she's lived there her whole life. And she has this condition, which we were talking about a moment ago, disassociative identity disorder. And she's been in therapy, hang on to your seats, for almost three decades. She's a published author of three books on the subject of DID and is an accomplished blogger. She gives uh, a number of presentations publicly. Her goal, her personal goal, is to get as much true information out to the public and mental health professionals as possible to raise awareness of the validity of DID and to help stamp out the stigma that's attached to it due to the negative facts propagated by the media. I mean, the media doesn't understand this condition. It is really an odd presentation. It's scary. It's spooky. It's like you've been taken over in some way. So, Shirley, please begin by telling us a little bit about yourself now, and then we'll get into when you got diagnosed and how all this happened for you. Uh, now I live a fairly quiet life. I still have some problems with dissociating, uh, losing time, uh, and uh, ordering things I didn't know I did or saying things I didn't know I said. But for the most part, my life's quieted down quite a bit from, the, <laughs> from where it was in the start. Um, in the beginning, it was just pure chaos. So you were disintegrated in a way and in multiple places and really were not aware of it. Yes, I was totally unaware that I thought everybody had problems like that. I really didn't know it was abnormal. It was my normal. It still is for the most part. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I have no idea what it's like to have a day where I remember everything, and then you would understand what it would be like to live like, from moment to moment uh, you know, with missing time. Uh, it's just the way it is. And I think people need to know it's not a memory problem in no. the sense of a primary memory problem. It may look like a memory problem, but tell us a little more about that, if you will, please. Oh, the, uh, I have uh, over, I have several, uh, I don't even really know the count of altered. I know there are at least 72, and there are probably a lot more, because there are fragments and, and, and pre-verbal children, and they all have their memories and their thoughts and their way of doing things. And, and well, Hold on just a second. You used the word alters. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Sure. 
you're on a good roll there. But there are people that don't know what an altar is. Oh, yes. Is. So okay. if you want to take a minute for that, I appreciate it. I can explain the best I can from, a, from my point of view. Um, I'm not a doctor. I'm, I'm just, I only hold an associate's degree. But I have a lot of experience, and I've done research. And what I understand an altar is, is that all humans form ego states to handle different situations. Let's say you go to work or you, you, have a, you, you express yourself at work differently than you do when you meet your, fan, your friends at the bar after work. I mean, your, your behaviors are different. Your thoughts are different. Mm -hmm. but you're, and, and normally in a person's personality, those ego states can communicate. They, they, they'll have the barriers between them. So their li your life's lived pretty much as a running narrative. But when you have severe trauma in early childhood, um, because of attachment disorder problems and all kinds of other things that are going on in your, in your brain and your mind, you, it, the, very just, it, the child just gets totally overwhelmed. And they begin to dissociate, to, uh, put the, to send over, over there when something is happening to the body, you know, uh, to fade into the wallpaper or do whatever it takes to survive. And the barriers become, they just go up between these ego states and they take on a life of their own. So between these different personalities, now, honestly, I'll tell you right now, I've met some people who had DID with a variety of alters, but I never have anybody keep count and get up to 72. Good. And then also talk about pre-verbal. Please fill us in a little bit. Number one, how you can keep count, how you have any idea what's going on there, and then how you actually recognize a pre-verbal person that you uh, inhabited for a while? Well, the best I can explain, it's very difficult to, for me to explain to a singleton, uh, or single, you know, a person with a single alter. Well, I'm trying. We call you guys singletons, people who okay. don't have multiples, okay? <laughs> I'd say so, I'm a singleton, there's yeah, no question. Okay. <laughs> so it's, hard, it's, it's, it's like talking French to a German person, but, yeah. but I can explain the best I can. Um, I met my, I've met, I knew my alters were there all along, but I didn't understand exactly what was going on or who they were, or that, that it was even affecting my life the way it was. But, um, when I got in therapy, uh, my, my therapist, um, uh, we could, because I needed to, to start communicating with these alters and, and make peace. Um, I began to make relationships with them. Um, I went, I, we formed a safe place in my mind, the, a very nice beach. And uh, I would go sit on the beach and wait for somebody to show up. And, of course, it's all taking place in my head. You know, it's not real. And uh, very slowly, through another altar named uh, Bianca, who's my 18-year-old, very interesting self, um, she knows everybody. And she introduced me very slowly to the others. And uh, uh, some, you know, only, if, only maybe 15, 20 of them have names. The rest of them are just presence you know I know they're there and the pre-verbals are that way I know they are there I, I actually can see them in my mind but like I say they're pre-verbal and they're just they're just babies they're babies mm -hmm. okay um, because it started my the, the abuse started at birth so it's not so far-fetched so then now that we get a little bit of an idea of the struggle you have with multiple personalities uh, sometimes communicating, sometimes not communicating with mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then having certain personalities that can com communicate and translate to you some of the things these other personalities are doing. Mm -hmm. So it gets a little bit confusing to the, the public. Yes. Uh, but you know what's going on, I think it's really important to say right here, and this is one of the things you're talking about when you talk about the media, is Shirley's not psychotic. No. You know, so she's not psychotic. She's not on atypical antipsychotics. But she's got a weird relationship with her reality in that she comes and goes in, her, in and out of her reality. Uh, sometimes, uh, I would imagine, in a destructive, uncomfortable way. No, I mean, not about destructive. But then I'm guessing, please tell us about this, in a constructive learning way. So could you tell us a little bit about those differences, if you don't mind? Well, I think it's very important to, for people to remember that these alters are not other people. They are me. There's only one personality in here. Good point. Yep. They are just different aspects of the same personality, just like everybody else has different aspects. And um, I'm sorry, I lost your question. <laughs> well, no, that's okay. The, the issue, I, all I was trying to do was get the polarization. It goes on in terms of contributions 
they're, they're different aspects oh, yes, of yourself, yes. but then where are you going to go? Is it good or is it bad? How does all that uh, play out in your, in your own working relationship with yourself? Well, now that I've pretty much made peace with everyone, we, I, I, use their, I use my alter's different talents. Um, Bianca is very good with street smarts. She can figure her way out of anything, which is, of course, saying I can. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I, I, we get together as a team. We're a team. You know, we work together as a team. I have parts that um, can handle my two-year-old nephew. They know how to, to take care of him in, in ways that, uh, I wouldn't have a clue, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, because they can relate to a two-year-old because some of them are only four and five years old. So it's like, oh, well, what do I do here? Well, what would you do with this personality? Oh, yeah, that's what I would do. You know, it's, it, there, there, of course, there's negatives. I mean, I've, I've ordered things with credit cards. I have a credit card floating around this, in my bedroom. I have no idea where it is because if I don't, if they don't want me to know where something is, I will not find it. <laughs> but, um, as long as, as long as uh, they don't do anything illegal, and it has happened a couple times, believe it or not, I have gotten in trouble a few times, but not deeply. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, there are negatives and there are positives. The positives far outweigh the negatives for me. I mean, they've helped me stay alive and stay sane, and I'm grateful for that. Well, there are two questions that come to mind. I'm going to save one for you in a minute. Uh, which is this whole question of integration and all that sort of thing. But mm -hmm. first of all, let's run the tape all the way back. This is interesting. You've certainly caught our attention with uh, these variety of um, disparate personalities. The question is, when did you first find this was going on? How did you get diagnosed? How does a person understand this? The reason I even entered therapy in the first place is I got so, so, so serious, severely depressed that I was going to kill myself on my 30th birthday. I made a pact with myself. I was going to do it. And my, I, 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 thank God I told my brother, and he insisted that I see someone. And so I walked into Paula's office the first time in a totally, I don't even remember actually the first several visits. And, uh, uh, it took her two or three months watching me, talking to me, watching me phase in and out in her office. I mean, just blank out, nobody home. And she finally says, Shirley, I think it's safe to say that you live with, at that time it was 1990, you live with multiple personality disorder. And mm -hmm. I said, there's a name for it. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, was, I was really kind of, I was upset but relieved at the same time. Because mm -hmm. if it has a name, you can work on it. You know, and... Uh, uh, that began my travels down the road less taken. I mean, it was, it, 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 it was, it was, the road is long and hard. Well, when you say that, before we get into this, this other question I was talking about, how does therapy actually take place? Does your therapist help you fall, form, pardon me, constructive relationships with the different personalities? I mean, is there an attempt to integrate or is it an attempt to understand the different personalities what actually happens in therapy with a person with uh, multiple personalities? How does that work? I was very fortunate to have a therapist who, even though she had no experience with it, she was willing to use all her skills to find ways to help me. Now, she didn't tell me how to do it. She, she was more of just a leading guide, a seeing eye dog. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was like Helen Keller was with, with, with her, with uh, um, um, uh, her, her, Mentor, you know, um, oh, I can't think of a name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, um, yes, anyway. Doesn't occur to me either. Yeah, no. Anyway, Annie Sullivan, with Annie mm -hmm. Sullivan. Annie Sullivan couldn't tell Helen Keller how to see. She just kind of led her until she figured it out on her own. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what a good therapist does. They don't, they don't cram things down your throat. And they don't tell you what to do. They help you find it yourself. And, that, and Paula was very, very good at that. Um, so, again, though, one thing I want to really uh, dig in a little bit, because I think there's a big question in the public community, um, because it seems so mysterious. You know, a person's fragmented. Is the goal to actually get them unfragmented, or is the goal to have them tolerate the fragmentation in some way? And how do each of those different uh, things work out? How does that work for you? The goal at first, I think Paul tried to help me integrate in a way that was traditional. You know, you try to pull everybody together into one cohesive personality. The problem is, I don't, in my opinion, it's not possible. I think that um, 
the I can no more be a singleton at my age than you could be a multiple at yours. Mm -hmm. you know, it's impossible because the damage is done. And, and, and okay, so what do you do? You form relationships, cooperation, coexistence. Uh, somebody has to be the leader. That turned out to be me. And um, what it, what, the way Paula explained it to me, and it's so succinct, it's so good. She said, Shirley, it's like, it's an orchestra. Everybody's really good at their instruments, but they have no leader, and they're all playing their own songs, and it makes total chaos. It makes no sense. But you get a maestro up there, and with good practice, they work together, and soon they start making beautiful music. And that's exactly what happens, or should happen, in integration. You know, the, trying to force someone to do something that's not going to happen is a waste of time. And my, and my, and me, I just feel that. Working together and recognizing these are me, they are me, and I am them, and we are one. It's just that they, you know, it's a little different than what other people's existence are. Reality is. So you really developed a team, and yes. you're walking around with a full-on team all the time. Yeah, it's never. So the question is then: this, <laughs> this, how do you? What happens? I mean. I would think it'd be quite surprising when, when somebody pops out, but I guess what you're doing is over time you're becoming more and more comfortable with the fact that one of these team members is just going to yeah. have long notes on the fiddle. It's going to happen. And, and, you know, it is what it is, right? I mean, uh, it's always happened all my life, so it's nothing new. <laughs> it's just not I know it's happening. You know, uh, and, and, you know and, sometimes, and when it does happen, uh, sometimes it does throw me for a loop. and It scares me a little bit. But then I realize, well, you know, okay, nothing horrible happened. Nothing ever really happens when I switch. Just, you know, people don't notice and I don't notice and things, life goes on. So you achieve a certain measure of mastery by integrating not the personalities and completely losing them, mm -hmm. but by working with them as a team. Yeah, you work so together. So they don't disappear. Yeah. They're still part of you. Yeah. And it's quite all right. And, yeah. and So you just have your little surprises from, from time to time. Yes. <laughs> now, let me ask you a personal question. We haven't rehearsed any of this stuff. Are, are you married? No, I was once. Well, what happens to people you're close to? I mean, marriage is one thing, but I'm just talking about close people, period. I was assuming that you might be married. And I think the closer you are with a person, the more of this... I live with my brother and his wife and their baby. How's all that work out? Well, you know, <laughs> my brother knows all about it. He's very accepting. He knows that, you know, uh, to expect some strange things once in a while. And he's very accepting the whole thing. He's like, well, you know, Bianca was here <laughs> when he recognizes. But the most, the most important thing to remember is when a person switches, most likely you are not going to know, even if you know the person extremely well. It's not like in the movies where, oh, a child alter shows up and they're like a little kid. It doesn't happen that way. Mainly because I have to trust you very, very well before I'm going to switch in front of you unless I'm extremely stressed. Like if I came home and my house is on fire and my family was inside, all bets are off. I couldn't tell you who's going to show up. Mm -hmm. But, but on, even under extreme other stress, no, 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 no. It's not going to happen. My therapist, who I saw for many, many years, and I trusted more than anybody in the world, only met four. In all that time. So yes, you, you could, uh, to, to translate it real quickly and get, get our um, uh, visualization of what's going on, when you really trust someone, then you feel more comfortable on some level or the person feels more comfortable in coming out and introducing themselves and, and being there. And I have to allow it, you too, you know, it's not just, a, and you know, it's the whole idea of forming dissociative disorder is to hide. And, of course, you're not going to come out to people you don't know. You know, mm -hmm. it's just not going to happen. Not that, no, it will happen, but they're not going to know it. Okay? There's a difference there. It will happen, but they won't know it. I can't tell you how many people I've met in Walmart that, <laughs> oh, hi, Bianca. Uh, I just play along. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make them feel bad, you know. Oh, my gosh. Well, listen, we're going to take a little break here, and I'm going to ask you this question when we get back, because I'm – I think a lot of us are wondering this, uh, you know, wh where we go with this from the point of view of when you have a problem like this, what are the challenges you have that would keep you from actually getting better? What are the things that a person would be impediments to you moving along developmentally in your life? And we'll ask that in just a moment. We're going to take a brief break right now. 
for our sponsors. We'll come back and find out how you how you manage that going down the road. Well, folks, you know as well as I do that psychiatric treatment failure, especially after multiple medication trials and those very, very brief hospitalizations, may prove insufficient to deal at home with the complexity of troubled children and, and those adolescents from 6 to 17 years old. Improved care, those next mandatory steps, should include a more comprehensive approach to address those multiple levels of challenges, from family to peers to school, diagnostically from defiance to depression on every level for families, including military families, internationally. The Barry Robinson Center's 32-acre open college-like campus in Norfolk, Virginia, provides safety and security and clean, comfortable living. How do we know? We refer folks over there all the time, strongly endorse what they're doing. So for further information and informed interview, connect at this page, barryrobinson.org forward slash core. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful, cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's d-h-a-l-a-b.com forward slash core. Well, welcome back, folks. We're here uh, and we're collecting ourselves with this conversation because when we listen to something like this, it seems actually somewhat, uh, it's somewhat anxiety provoking because a person's managing a whole crowd of people uh, under different circumstances. Reality does change. And what we were wondering from Shirley is what happens as you go down the road? uh, What would be a goal that you would see in terms of overcoming the problems? And how do you actually, what's your self-talk like when these when these different uh, adversities occur, and maybe you can't quite integrate the way you wanted to. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Going down the road. Wow. It, it, it's a long, long travel, let me tell you. It takes many years to get to, get to where I am now. Um, I'm sorry, you're going to have to break down the question a little bit more. Well, uh, sorry, I was a little vague. I'm just thinking about your your handicaps going along the road. So you've got a problem mm-hmm. and I'm really it's, to get down to the bottom line is what do you do about it when you hit a, when you hit a uh, speed bump in the road of life, how do you actually reintegrate yourself in a constructive way? Because look, everybody in therapy has problems as they go through therapy, but when you're handling a whole team mm-hmm. then you have to me just thinking about it, it makes it infinitely more, challenging and i wonder if there are any tools tricks hints oh yes that you could say hey parker this is what i do i mean i don't know what anybody else does but this has worked for me and then i tried this and this didn't work for me if you could give us a little bit okay i understand what you're asking okay the things that i (laughs) there was a lot of trial and error um i have had oh my the decision to get well was the first terrible um when you have any kind of emotional, physical problem, sometimes you get so used to the idea that you have a problem, you know, you can't see the forest for the trees. You don't want to, sometimes some part of you doesn't want to get well. You know, you, you uh, kind of eat and sleep and live your diagnosis. And getting past that, that's, that was the biggest hurdle of all to start off. Um, the decision to get well and the decision to live. Those are the two major hurdles mm-hmm. that anybody has. I've met so many people with DID, and that's what they'll say. You know, um, I had to decide I wanted to move forward in the first place, and I had to decide I wanted to live to get to the other side. And uh, 
that takes it, it takes a lot of guts to face this stuff head on. It just does. And it's very tiring at times. It's very you can just imagine the fatigue at times. <laughs> it's like oh, having a whole room. You're just going to bed at night. It's like having a whole room full of people talking about different subjects at the same time in your head. It, well, it's like it, <laughs> forgive me for interrupting, but I'm sure. imagining you. I'm kind of. Uh, attempting to get into your head and, and imagine what it would be like experiencing that. And I think one of the things about going on and living would be dealing with reality as it actually is uh -huh. uh, by your by yourself, who you actually are, instead of one of these other individuals. Mm -hmm. you know, and and there, so there's a certain measure of facing reality as opposed to regressing in a way and having different people handle different aspects yes. of reality as they come up. So there's a, there's a certain courage that's involved and a person has to be aware of that ne ne of the necessity of taking that next step and being courageous to say i'm going to face my own reality that's what i'm going to do for the rest of my yeah. life and, and the, one of the things paula had to work with me the hardest was you know and i faced many multiple faces is oh well i didn't do that she did that no she's me it's things i've said and done to harm other people or did whatever i've done I did that, and I have to take responsibility for that, you know, not putting it off on, oh, yeah, I'm too sick. No, 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 no. I'm responsible for my behaviors, my actions, my words. You know, uh, facing the realities of your past, that, that, that this history is mine. These, the, the memories of these felt personalities hold, they're, me, they're my history. Mm -hmm. That's painful. Uh, but, you know, it's so all you, worth it in the end. So part of the recovery then, and this is an important point, I think, is and tell me correct me if i'm wrong but part of the recovery is not only looking forward to the future and how you're going to be your true self in the future but just what you said i think is very important is like coming to grips with your past in mm -hmm. some constructive way instead of being bowled over by whatever happened to you traumatically when yeah. you were younger is that true yeah you go th and you go through stages you will go through stages if you're covering from this stuff you'll go and they throw them in and out of them uh there's 10 of them actually i've actually started a book about it where the first couple first couple of years especially i mean revengeful feelings uh um poor me poor me you know um uh, oh my god feeling you know it, it being like you said bowled over by it uh, and it takes it takes a very talented therapist and a lot of guts to finally pull pull you get your head above water, and that, that's the moment when you start really seeing progress when you get past that stage, because then it's like oh well okay now what do I do with it you know what do I do from here? And you so can start what you're saying I'm going to translate that for just a second sure. for for myself and sure. for our audience and see whether this is right with you. It seems like what happens there is that you go from a role of being a victim. Yes. with what happened to you yes into a role of self mastery you yes. know you're not going to lay down and be rolled over by the bus anymore that's right you're actually going to stand up and do self mastery even though there's a serious complexity going on with a, a, a number of different realities that you're facing but you could pull together and have the internal strength to master yourself as opposed to as you said just a moment ago uh, poor me, I can't. I can't do it. I'm. It's impossible. I'm going to yeah. wind myself to death. Yes, and you know, it's, it's very. It's, it's just. I had somebody tell me one time I was one of the bravest people she ever knew. I said, I know a whole bunch more people that are like me. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, yeah. It's it's it's. Uh, I was trying to think of the phrase that, that somebody told me one time that was so important. Um, Oh, it won't come to me right now. But there's, the, yeah, the, it's, it's a, it's a growing experience. And you know, I am in control of who I am. I mean, letting it, letting my past rule me would just be a waste. You know, there's so much I could do in my life, and so much I could do for other people. You know. So besides writing and doing the blogging and doing speaking, are you? Do you have an occupation? I mean, what's your life like in in everyday life? What what's actually happening there? Well, I have had some three physical, severe physical problems, which often accompanies people with dissociative identity disorder. Oh, tell us about um, that, please. Yeah, I had a stroke back in 2000, um, and I'm in a wheelchair now because of it, and uh, I'm a little limited on what I can do. Uh, but, hey, <laughs> it is what it is, like I keep saying. It's my mm -hmm. favorite motto. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, my wheelchair, I just look at it as a tool. It just gets me around. 
and uh, uh, I take I can take care of myself. You know, I can I can get myself around, and I, I'm grateful for that. You know, it it just is part of who I am. But um, I don't work. I've been on disability since 1995. And I'm um, hoping one of these days to be able to get off of it. But if I don't, well, that's, again, once again, it is what it is. Well, you're doing well linguistically and conceptually, I'll say that. Oh, I, yes. You know, you, you don't have any speech problems. No, I'm very lucky. It affected mainly my legs. Um, it didn't really affect my upper part of my body. It did some, but not, not as bad as it did to my legs. And mm -hmm. I've also had breast cancer. I had to have her breasts removed, and yeah, you know, this has been a lot. Of, that was only a few years ago. I lived in a long-term facility for seven and a half years because of, I uh, lost control of my uh, mind as far as being able to take care of myself, and I had to live there for seven and a half long years. It was a psychiatric facility. It was. Was it a state hospital or something? Uh, no, it, there's a nearby nursing home that has a psychiatric wing. Oh. Yeah, it, uh, it it saved my life, and it got me where I am today. That structure must have been good for you because you had predictable moments. You had a reality which was fairly consistent. I checked, <laughs> let me tell you about that. I checked in there in uh, 2005. I didn't know I was there until 2007. Oh, I lost really? Two, yeah, I lost two years. Was well, it post-stroke? No, that was involved with the DID. It had nothing to do with the stroke. Yet, Is that right? Yeah. See, I'm always looking for the organic reason, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so in this case, it was played uh, traumatic. Now, in terms of, do you do any special kinds of treatment like EMDR? Have you done neurofeedback? Have you done anything else that would be sort of a, a reintegration with traumatic events like that in your therapy? I tried uh, EMDR, but it didn't work for me very well. It doesn't for some people. Uh, the, the best way Paula and I found was she had a blank white wall on her Dexter desk. And I go in and start, start try, I, I try to tell her things, but I just start spacing out. And finally she said, okay, Shirley, this is what we're going to do. I want you to project onto that wall in black and white and slow motion what you're trying to tell me. And then just tell me what you see. It worked. I don't know why. <laughs> I just know it did. Mm -hmm. And I was able to start working through these traum traumatic thoughts and memories and, and feelings. And it, it took a long time, but it, it worked. Did you ever do anything like hypnosis or anything that might be a little less, um, that might be a little more supportive in a way? I mean, I think EMDR has some activity with it. There's, some, there's a certain um, acuity to EMDR that isn't there with hypnosis. Did you ever do anything like that? Hypnosis? No, I've never done hypnosis. I no, uh, Paula didn't do it, and she, she recommended I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, you can take all those barriers too fast and be overwhelmed. So it was better to just take it slow, for me anyway. No, no, that's it's understandable. I, I haven't experienced that with anybody and haven't heard about it, but it's a, it's a thoughtful idea that someone might, but you, apparently what, what you're saying is that is not good for you. No, for me it wasn't. I mean, there was just too much. I mean, even just the first few years, oh, wow, overwhelmed by emotions and feelings the way it was. <laughs> So when you do a presentation, what is the theme of your presentation? What is your mission and what do you hope to accomplish? Because that's kind of what we would like to wrap it up with here a little bit because that's really kind of who you are right now. It's what yes. you're doing. And uh, so where, when you do a presentation, when you go in there and your mental set, what's your mission? My main mission is to get people, help people understand that people with dissociative disorders are not weirdos. We're not. We're just human beings who found a unique way to handle and un, just unsurvivable, unimaginable circumstances. You know, take away the stigma. We're not. We can't climb walls. We're not supernatural. We're not. We're not beings from outer space. We're just human beings. And to end that stigma, that's got to stop. I mean, there's so many people out there who are undiagnosed and or underdiagnosed because clinicians have a hard time standing behind the diagnosis or even recognizing it. Uh, and the media is out there spreading all this, <laughs> these movies and things where, you know, <laughs> well, I mean, they did, it, isn't, it isn't real. It isn't the way it really works. I, you know, it just, it, was just, it just doesn't. And, uh, I, you know, I have doctors and nurses and people ask me questions. Well, how would I respond to you if you came in the ER and you were dissociated? I said, if I were dissociating a child, just treat me like I'm a kid. Because in all, for all intents and purposes, that's who you're dealing with. 
And these are very good questions, and I, I really enjoy talking to the public about this because I want them to understand, you know. Uh, I'm tr I had to go through this stuff without anybody breaking ground for me. You know, it was pretty much I was on my own, and Paula, Paula, Paula and I were on our own. And this is like, I want to spread this information to help other people who are living with this disorder that can to tell them there is hope. You don't have to live in this trauma drama all your life. Once you get past the worst part of it, you start going uphill. I mean, how, you can only go up from here. Mm -hmm. You know, you've lived through 100% of your worst days. The only way is up. You know, the only way, the way is up. Well, you know, this has been a very interesting conversation on a topic that is not really covered much at all in the public media. They, there's no, I mean, if you really think about it, how often do you hear somebody actually talk about what happens to them? Oh, I know. And, Without, so, and they sensationalize it so much. Just, you know, it's yeah, not sensational. I mean, you know, there's some pain involved, but there's some positive uh, evolution that you're taking and making with yourself. Shirley, I think it's just a fantastic job that you're doing with yourself, and I think it's great that you're out there talking about it. Tell us about the name of your book again, if you would, please. Um, I have uh, three. The one I'm giving away or the, other, or the two I'm not? Well, let's talk about the, Let's just talk about all of them. Let's get it okay. all on, on tape here. All right. Uh, Dissociative Identity Disorder in a Nutshell, uh, a first-hand account is my first book about it. Um, it, it, it you know, I don't, de I don't tell uh, gruesome details about what happened to me in my past. I don't see the reason for it, and I'm not going to do it. It's too triggering and hurtful. So I talk about the facts as I understand them, you know, what, how it forms, where it came from. I even talk about people who don't believe in it and, and, and ask people to, you know, I remind people I'm not a professional and to look at it for themselves and, and just don't believe everything you hear. Look, for, look at it and, and judge for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the second book is um, uh, The Tears Will Cease, um, and it is about, um, it's about uh, recovery. Uh, it's a kind of a workbook, and I'm giving that away. Um, it goes through some of the stages and explains you know, the, the drama and the trauma and what's going to happen when you get into treatment. Um, and I'm giving that away on my blog site for free. At the bottom of my site is a link to a PDF. Oh, cool. And the other book is, uh, um, um, hang on for a second, uh, yeah, um, uh, uh, Becoming the Wonders of Integration. And that's the one where I discuss my views and my opinions on integration. Well, that is going to be interesting. I didn't see that. I was going to help you with it. I'm looking over your show notes here, and uh, I, I just didn't see it in there, and I'll make sure I look it up. Is that on Amazon? Yes, they are all on Amazon. Okay. But the one that's for free, yeah, you can get still on Amazon, but you might as well get it for free from me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and we're going we're gonna to have as a drawing on our site, uh, Dissociative Identi Identity Disorder uh, in a nutshell. We're going to uh, DID in a nutshell, firsthand account. We're going to have that as a uh, drawing on our site. So we really appreciate your being with us on that. Yeah, no problem. And, so let's close with where people can go to connect with you in a meaningful way in terms of your activity on the internet. Um, you can go to my blog site. It's um, www.morgan6062.blog. I have all kinds of information on there, and there's a way to get hold of me, contact me, message me. Um, and I'm willing to help as much as I can, anyone. It's, it's fine. So do you travel for speaking gigs, or how does all that work? Yeah, we've traveled a little bit. Um, mostly it's been fairly local, but we're working on that. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to thank you very much. I'm sure everybody here listening is really appreciative of this. It's a very real first-person account of, uh, of your struggles. Uh, and we didn't really, I think it's interesting that we didn't have to go back and talk about everything that happened to you because is really looking forward. What kind of adversarial difficulties have you had as you go along and how do you reintegrate? I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing that book with our, with our community here. We appreciate it. Well, thank you. So thank you very much, Shirley. We appreciate you coming on board and we'll sign right off. You have a great day. You too. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications 
like those written for ADHD, are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.